Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Russell Spriglia, uh, Assistant Professor of English at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. Uh, I want to begin by saying that as much as I'm sure everyone watching this is excited for the discussion we're about to have, um, we all do so with a heavy heart for the loss of our dear friend and comrade, Michael Brooks, who uh, passed away very suddenly this past July at the far too young age of, of 36. Um, this is just the first of many roundtable discussions on various topics regarding the left and leftist politics that we're planning to air in honor of Michael over the next couple of weeks or next uh, handful of weeks. Uh, and the roundtables are going to uh, feature a number of familiar faces that viewers and listeners of the Michael Brooks show will be well familiar with. So keep your eyes peeled for notices about those. So if you're watching this, then chances are that you not only know our two guests today, but that you've also probably seen the interviews that Michael did with them on TMBS. Joining me now for a discussion about the future of the left, and considering that the mantra of TMBS was uh, left is best, I can't think of a more fitting topic with which to begin this tribute to Michael. Uh, joining me are uh, Cornell West and Slavoj Žižek, and it's my hope that we honor Michael this evening, not only by remembering him, which of course we will do some of that, um, but also carrying on the work that he was so fervently committed to and so fervently um, believed in. So we don't really need introductions, but I'll do, I'll do some brief ones. Uh, Dr. Cornell West is professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University, as well as class of 1943 university professor emeritus at Princeton. Uh, I also wanted to mention, because I've been enjoying it, that with Trisha Rose, he co-hosts the recently launched podcast, The Tightrope, um, which I've been watching on YouTube. <laughs> uh, Slavoj Žižek is senior researcher and professor of philosophy at the University of Ljubljana in his home country of Slovenia, which is where he's joining us from today. Uh, he's also international director of the uh, Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities at the University of London, as well as Professor of Philosophy and Psychoanalysis at the European Graduate School in Sospi, Switzerland. You know, we, we were talking a little bit about this before we started, but I know, so the two, the two of you appeared together, albeit in different segments, in Astra Taylor's Examined Life, which was 2008. But then I know that uh, the two of you, maybe two or three years before that, 2005 or six, were on a, a panel together at Princeton. I think Slavoj gave a talk and, and Cornell, you responded. Yeah, you yeah. Um, true. I just, I mean, I wanted to ask, have you guys, have you guys done anything since then? Or is that the last time that the two of you did something together? That is hard to say. I know we, we, we had a wonderful debate at Harvard before that. We were together at Princeton. I think we were at the new school. Yeah, we met no. once. I don't know where, but we met. Yeah, I think we were at the new school briefly. But it's always a blessing to be with brother. And you, you know man. what I remember, Cornell? In these times of serious troubles, we tend to forget the real important things that in at at uh, Harvard, Cambridge, but that we debated selling all those problems yes. at this trip. It was a wonderful debate because you know we both of us spontaneously reject this most stupid idea of. Now we have real problems, forget about philosophy. Now it's the time for philosophy. And I wonder, Cornell, if you would agree, look, I saw some report on CNN, I don't know where, a guy, white older man from Texas, protested against wearing a mask, and he says, I'm not a dog, I don't want to walk around in a muzzle. But you see, crisis like this one, forces even everyday people to think a little bit, even if wrongly, like philosopher. Like he's basically asking himself, what do I mean by my freedom and dignity? And for him, wrongly, but it's a serious effort to keep social distancing, to wear a mask in public means that in his spontaneous philosophy, this violates his sense of human dignity. That's why I always claim today more than ever, it's not just a medical crisis, just an economic crisis. It's time for real thinking. Absolutely, absolutely. 
I mean, it reminds me actually of, of our dear brother, Michael Jamal Brooks, though, uh, uh, the son of, of Donna and Glenn. Oh, they did such a wonderful, wonderful job on that brother because he understood this is the moment for serious critical thinking, yes. for yes. serious yes. philosophical yes. engagement. As what you talked about in your wonderful book, Courage of Hopelessness, learning how to act dangerously and courageously. The learn, learn, learn that Lenin talked about after 1914 when he went to Switzerland. Or that wonderful phrase you have in your text of Brother Zizak with a mile that says, uh, everything under the sun is, under the heavens is chaotic. The situation is excellent. That's a moment of possibility. That's a yes. moment of serious reflection, but always a reflection that has to do with the underlying assumptions of, in this case, the decline and fall of the American empire, the relative collapse of the neoliberal uh, predatory capitalist civilizations as we know it, and what kinds of alternatives we can try to project in terms of vision, in terms of organization, in terms of execution. But what I also loved about Brother Michael Brooks was that he had what Kafka, he had what Chekhov, he had what Beckett had. He had a deep sense of the comic. He had a deep sense of incongruity. And of course, Brother Zizek has that. <laughs> it's hard for him to philosophize and not give some kind of allusion to a film or a philosophical text that shows the incongruities that gets us to smile and grin in order to fortify ourselves intellectually, morally, and like Brother Michael Brooks, given his Buddhist sensibility, his spirit, his soul. So that he be we began to always acknowledge the way in which the economic, the predatory capitalist is hand in hand with the existential, that the spiritual goes hand in hand with the social. And of course our feminist sisters and womanist sisters have taught us the personal goes hand in hand with the political but in the end, it's not going to be a matter of identity. In the end, it's going to be a matter of intellectual integrity and solidarity in which class struggle has to be a fundamental lens through which we view the world as we come to terms with our various identities. And if all we talk about is identity, then that's going to get mobilized into a class politics. And we have to mention Adolf Reed Jr because there's really no Michael Brooks show without Adolph Reed Jr. I've seen his interviews with Adolph you know, many, many times, and he has taught us the centrality of class struggle, as has Zizek, as has Fred, Fred Jameson and some of the other important uh, leftists. I know another important guy. Do you know him? Cornel West, who also taught us some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can ignore that guy. He's not so great, but just to remind you. <laughs> you very well, yeah. well, <laughs> That, I mean, that, so that, that you, the, when you mentioned Adolf Reed there, there's a, there's a clip. I'll, I'll cut it and I'll send it to both of you, but one of the, the last episodes of TMBS that Michael filmed before he passed, it's a great like one minute clip. And he's specifically talking about his three intellectual heroes and his like bucket list interviewees. And it's the two of you and, and Adolf Reed. And I was so, I mean, very glad that he was able to connect with the three of you. I mean, I wish he was here to be doing this right now because he's the person who should be you know, moderating this, but, um, but well, no, we, 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 we're, we're glad to have you brother Russell. We are blessed to have you working on Melville and Lacan, Melville, the greatest literary artist in the history of the American empire coming to terms with the empire and white supremacy and class rooted in the best of the West, critical of the worst of the West. So we, we're glad to have you as well though, brother, but it's true <laughs> that, uh, that brother Michael, you know, he was a genuine intellectual. He was a genuine human being. He had so much love in him, so much love in him. Well, that's what I wanted to ask the two of you. I wanted, you know, it was more than just, you know, interviewing the two of you. I mean, it was clear that you were developing a personal, like, in absolute before. And so, you know, um, uh, brother West, like you, before, uh, before, before Michael interviewed you in April, the two of you were on a panel in Harvard in, uh, I think it was late January, it was, um, part of a conference uh, with the student group Harvard for Bernie. And I saw the, I watched the video, I saw the pictures. And then Slavoj, Michael, he first interviewed you last October. And then before 
the pandemic came and canceled mm -hmm. everything. We had arranged, you know, you were going to come to New York and be on TMBS in studio. <laughs> Michael was really going to uh, take you up on that offer to go for matzo ball soup with him at, uh, <laughs> at Katz's in Brooklyn. Uh, but even though you couldn't come, he ended up, you were on, uh, he interviewed you again, I think in, in late April remotely. So, you know, as, as a leftist thinker and commentator and advocate, it's, it's easy to see why and, and how really, if you read uh, Michael's work and watch his, his interviews, you know, how he was influenced by both of your work and why he gravitated toward you both. But, you know, I wanted to just flip things around a little bit here and ask, you know, what attracted you toward, or, you know, made you gravitate toward, toward Michael, whether it was on the show um, some of his texts, you know, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Slava, why don't you start? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, very briefly, I want to connect also to what Cornell already said. First, okay, this may alienate some of the viewers, but what I admired in Michael is that he was an authentic leftist. What was totally absent in him was what I called with some <coughs> so-called politically correct people, this opportunist side of political correctness, you know, without seeing the deeper roots and so on, quite often, <coughs> sorry, political correctness can work in a way which reinforces certain prejudices and so on and so on. I have many brothers, black friends, who are very sensitive to this. They very intelligently perceive patronizing, con condescending edit attitude in obeying politically correct rules and so on and so on. And he was an authentic anti-racist. Anti anti Let me give you a proof so I don't take too much time. The last time I spoke of him about preparing, I don't know even if this entered then the talk with Michael, was we had a short, spontaneous Hegelian debate about how particularity and universality relate. And we, I proposed the example, and he loved it, I hope sincerely, uh, of uh, that, you know, this uh, elementary reproach to Black Lives Matter, of white supremacies. But why only Black Lives Matter? Do not all lives matter, you know? No. Because in every concrete situation, yes, all lives matter abstractly, but in every concrete situation, there is a certain form of racism which, as it were, colors all the others, which is typical for that epoch. And I will be very fair here. In the same way that in Germany of 1930s, in 45, you cannot talk about racism without mentioning anti-Semitism. In the same way that today in Israel, you cannot talk about racism without mentioning the Palestinians. In the United States for a long time, any general talk about racism without seeing that the blacks are the type. They, they are what Hegel called concrete universality. You can gain access to the universality of racism today in the United States precisely by focusing as a starting point on the racism against black. And now I come to my Hegelian paradox. That's why Black Lives Matter is a truly universal claim in the sense that it covers all racism, while well, that's a beautiful paradox. All lives matter is really a particular claim, because in the concrete situation, it privileges certain values, white, upper middle class, and so on, through which we then locate, perceive racism, and so on, and so on. That's why, in my bad taste humor, I cannot restrain myself from ending my third favorite version of this Lives Matter. I found it in Australia, but I think it's now known around the world. It's a poster of Stalin holding uh, some kind of a plate on which it says, no Lives Matter, you know. But in a way, not in the way Stalin would have meant it. 
people like Agamben say, oh, today we are just survivalist machines, we are losing our dignity and so on. No, for all those thousands today of nurses, social workers and so on, who fight to save lives, they are not survivalist machines. They are consciously saying, ultimately, I have my duty to do. My life matters less to me than my duty. So it's not true that today in the pandemic, if we try to save people's lives, that we are turning into survivalist machines, just objects of science and so on and so on. Everybody talks like just about this aspect. But no, there are maybe even millions of cases of wonderful solidarity in my country, Slovenia. Thousands of health workers are risking their lives, they are underpaid and so on. And my God, you get from them a beautiful Kantian, referring to Immanuel Kant's statements, like they ask them, but you're risking your life for a misery, why are you doing it? They say, I am doing it because I cannot look in my face if I would not have been doing it. I cannot not do it, you know. You also discover what I cannot but call ethical miracles today. How people discover this elementary decency. And that's why I wonder, Cornel, if you would agree, when we were young, we were playing those games, obscenity, you do this, whatever, to those in power. But now with Trump and so on, those which were in power and uh, right-wing populists, they are quite obscene enough. Maybe we, the left, should also insist a little bit and maybe even risk to use this much abused term. We know put in circulation, I think, by Richard Nixon. Sorry, but people like Bernie Sanders, AOC, and so on, they are the true moral majority, my God. They stand for ordinary honesty, decency, and so on. The, the, the new right is today obscene. They are doing just breath, breathtaking things. You know, you know what happened? Uh, maybe Americans should know this, because Trump tried to establish good contacts with Viktor Orban. You know what? A big from or, or, uh, Orban's Hungary cultural figure uh, did two days ago in a public statement of Ed. He said that George Soros owns the biggest gas chamber in Europe, that he is worse than Hitler, that he's, uh, he's spreading a cyanide-like poison, which is called multicultural tolerance. And in this sense, he is today's Hitler. He says this, more dangerous than Hitler, more, and so on and so on. This is, and the, now people who accuse sometimes even you of anti-Semitism, I tell them, sorry, this is anti-Semitism. This yes. is vulgar abuse, and I just wonder how often people who, you know, protect Israel when it's doing bad things, attacking the Palestinians, can be very anti-Semitic here. For example, you remember, Cornell, that guy, crazy guy, who a couple of years ago killed dozens in a social democratic camp, Brady, the crazy Norwegian guy? Oh, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends sent me his uh, diaries, manuscripts, some of them translated. You know what's so interesting? There he defends Israel, Israel, the bastion uh, protecting the West. But he says, but in the West, no Jews. They should move move to Israel to protect us there. That is to say, it's this deep link between protecting Israel there, supporting Israel against the Palestinians, and remaining anti-Semitic here. And I claim Trump was also doing this in a more refined way, but so that, you know, would you agree, Cornel, when friends tell me, uh, but you have to choose, Palestinians or Israelis, I say, no, the moment you accept this, as a choice, you sold your soul to the devil. This mm. is the same mm. struggle. Yes, no, no. Against, must move you to protect Palestinians today. It's the same struggle. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I'm resonating deeply with you, my brother. 
But I love your notion of an ethical miracle. I love that, though. I yeah. mean, it reminds because me a little it's, bit. It's it's a miracle, miracle, actually, when that, it happens. <laughs> I mean, you know, James Baldwin used to say all of us are walking disasters and walking miracles at the same time. And of course, Ipsy called yeah. for miracles in, yeah. in, 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 in a dollhouse, calling for the transformation of some kind of sensitivity, shattering the indifference, shattering the callousness. And that's what I saw in Brother Michael Jamal Brooks. Yeah. When we first met, I said to myself, He's a fellow blues man. He's a fellow jazz man. He's, a, he's got a soulfulness about him. And that soulfulness is not just the sharing of a soothing sweetness against the backdrop of a sensitivity to catastrophe, but it's also Socratic. It's deeply self-critical. He's willing to, 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 to be, he, he, to muster the courage to scrutinize himself. That's where his sense of the comic comes from, that he doesn't take himself so seriously that he can't also open himself up to the ways in which he has been shaped by some of the very things he's critical of. That's what it is to be a human being at the deepest level. But he's profoundly prophetic. And by prophetic, it just means the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel says the shattering of the evil of indifference. Indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. And so it's not just the self-righteousness, which we see so deeply inscribed in neoliberal discourse. That's why mm -hmm. when, it comes to, when it comes to our brothers and sisters on the West Bank and Gaza, mm -hmm. that is hard for so many of our neoliberal folk to take seriously their plight and predicament because they talk about freedom and liberties, but they don't want to come to terms with the degree to which they're complicitous with a, cons a particular understanding of how they view the Middle East. And therefore, all they can see is our precious Jewish brothers and sisters, our precious Israeli brothers and sisters. And if you get locked into the either or that Brother Zizak is calling into the question, and you recognize, we just want moral integrity. We just want truth telling. We just want keeping track of structures of domination no matter what, so that it's very clear. Take somebody like that, like Thomas Friedman. He just wrote a piece yesterday uh, uh, when he talked about the, uh, the killing of the, the brother in Iran. Didn't say a word morally, didn't say a word ethically. Even Brennan, who's been a sponsor of terrorism from the US empire called it a criminal mm -hmm. act. Will you see that language used in the New York Times in relation to this act? Not at all. So you said, so we say, well, wait a minute, everybody knows if there was a Palestinian occupation and domination of Jewish brothers and sisters, it would be a different reaction. But there's an Israeli occupation of Palestinian brothers and sisters. Silence. So you see not just the inconsistency, but the cowardliness, the refusal to follow through on serious truth telling. And Adorno says something like, the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And the suffering is not just your group, your tribe, your gender, your sexual orientation, your nation. It's got to be global, human, yes. <laughs> international. And that's precisely why the best of what Brother Michael Brooks saw when he read The Best of Marx. That's what he saw when he read The Best of Du Bois. That's what he saw when he read The Best of Simone de Beauvoir and so forth. That's what he saw when he read Zizak. He says, here's somebody who's willing to be over against. Now, in my Christian language, I would put it in, Zizak is willing to be in the world, but not of it. And the in the world is the connection to the truth and the justice. I learned this in my black church on the chocolate side of Sacramento. If the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. Well, what kind of Socratic heaven are you leaving behind? What kind of ethical heaven are you leaving behind? Dostoevsky defined hell as those who suffer from the incapacity to love, like Hamlet. I deeply agree with you, which is why, you know, uh, some uh, theologists, I forgot, uh, forgot which one uh, 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 said something, maybe you will know, absolutely, Meister Eckhart, the great mystic. Oh, you know the great he mystic, said? yes, yes, yes. He said, I would rather be with Christ in hell than without without Christ in heaven. That's, that's it. Because Jesus is where hell is. 
That's <laughs> exactly right. And, <laughs> and now Dostoevsky says, Dostoevsky says, you remember in, in Joseph Frank's grade two volume of biography of Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky says, if, if Christ were on one side and reality was on the other, yeah. I would choose Christ because I go, I want the truth and I, I want unarmed truth. I want unconditional love. And that leads me to bear witness in a certain kind of way. And therefore, it's a similar kind of fork in the road. But what does that require? Oh, see, we're right back here again now. We're right back here again. <laughs> the courage of hopelessness. But the whole but, uh, is, is not Isn't there is a, a deep, 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 deep Don't deep show publicly public. pornography. Be, be, be careful. <laughs> 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 no, but seriously, Cornell, can I make another connection to this with the problem of how in some politically correct circles it's fashionable to claim old white men dismiss European inheritance? No. What? You mentioned examples, and I want to return to them, of how uh, one of the great things that black revolutionaries and thinkers did is that they were critical towards white legacy, but reappropriating it, and they were, they were more, in this way, more faithful to white legacy than white thinkers themselves. That's why, for me, the greatest event is not of the early 19th century, late uh, 18th, it's not French Revolution, it's Haiti Revolution. Only yes, a, yes. without Haiti, French Revolution would have been a matter of why it wouldn't have been world event as it is. It only became through Haiti. And here, one has to be honest. Jacobins immediately admitted it, eh, as you know, with Napoleon, it's a different story. So when people ask me, what do you mean by concrete universality, I like to give them another example. You know, one day in Haiti, when they wrote the constitution, uh, uh, accepted it on, I think, in, I think, 1804. You know how they define citizenship of Haiti, and I think it's a deep truth in it. They say, it says, Article 4 of the Constitution, all people of Haiti, all citizens, independently of the color of their skin, are black. You know in what sense this is true? <laughs> in our countries here, the model is white. white. If you are black and you are admitted into core of a society, it's always the silent preposition, yes, because you are really civilized, one of us, and so on and so on. You know? They Absolutely. Absolutely. They, but, you see, but for me, though, Brother Zizak, for me, it's really the, uh, it's the jazz musicians, it's the blues musicians. It's mm -hmm. because what they were able to do was to be deeply rooted in their own specific and distinctive traditions, but because they were tied to what the Greeks call arate, of excellence, yes. of the highest yeah, level yeah, of yeah. virtuosity, the highest yeah, level yeah. of virtue, they could hear a, a Stravinsky, they can hear a Shostakovich, they could hear a Beethoven, they could hear a Mozart, they could hear a Louis Armstrong, they could hear a Billy Arm, a, 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 a Sarah Vaughan, they could hear a, a, mm. a, a Billy Holiday and say, I am trying to wrestle with death, dread, despair, domination, and try to be a certain kind of human being in my short trek from my mama's womb to tomb. That's the humando of Vico. That's what it is to be human. How are you going to deal with this pilgrimage in the short time that you are here as a quest for excellence? And therefore, any talk about obsession with whiteness or brownness or yeah what kind of excellence what kind of courage what kind of vision what kind of willingness to yeah. tell the truth did they enact if Shelly is telling the truth in his poetry you go with Percy Percy got something to say if you if you if they if they're from Turkey and of course we should note the connection of Michael Brooks to Turkey now he spent some time in Ankara though yep. he already was connected to him and all the other traditional of uh, traditions of, of what the Turks themselves who have been cast as other. 
Same with true with Muslims. Same with true with Arab. Same with true with Dalit. Same with true with Roma. Same is true with poor white workers. Same is true with indigenous peoples. He had an all embracing internationalism grounded in his particularity. That is what John Coltrane's Love Supreme is all about. No, I deeply agree with you. And if you will agree, I will give you another example. You made a very important point here, because when I also advocate universalism, but in art, in thinking, universalism does not come with, let's erase my roots, let's just and think that's abstractly, that's right. only in going the deepest into your singular situation. For example, a big white example. Uh, uh, William Shakespeare, he's universal, but precisely because he comes from a very specific situation, he was possible only in that time and so on. So, the, but there is universality in him. And let me give you Absolutely. here how this being rooted in a particular situation opens up uh, to universality. I spoke with his, to be open to a little bit too liberal for me. I don't agree with him politically, not even <laughs> as a writer, but he made one nice point, uh, Salman Rushdie. Politically, I wouldn't uh, sell my mother into slavery for him, if I may put it in my terms. <laughs> at the debate where I was with him, he was asked, didn't you betray your nationhood? You come from India, but you totally forgot about your Indian roots. And you know what he said? He said, sorry, but two great Indian writers were the deepest influence on me. Jane Austen and Charles Dickens. Because <laughs> <laughs> the upper classes in India, where I grew up, this was Jane Austen, this impoverished nobility and so on. Or he said, when I saw poor people in the suburbs of Bombay, this is Dickens, Oliver Pease. So, you know, this is true universality, that in somebody like Dickens, you can recognize, again, your own specific situation. That's why, for me, in my, worst, in my worst Western, uh, Western European even orientation, when students ask me, okay, you talk a lot about subjectivity, but give me an example concrete that we can understand. I say Tony Morrison, beloved. That's the mm -hmm. deep insight into what sacrifices you have to go through to really become a free subject, to Absolutely. acquire subject. So that's the paradox of true universality. The Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, the more you are universal. But that is precisely why the greatest novelist in the history of modern times, Leo Tolstoy, had a picture of Charles Dickens on his wall. Why? Love you, man. Tell, let me tell you why. Because it was big fashion when I was young to say, well, Tolstoy, boring. No, it's Dostoevsky. No, don't underestimate Tolstoy. Absolutely. Tolstoy, Absolutely. Tolstoy had a wonderful incredibly modern theory of language, which is like this today's theories of men self-replicating viruses and so on. He's incredibly modern. Do not, so we agree here. I don't underestimate Tolstoy. Look, you, know, you, know, you know, Tolstoy, with the, if you follow the underground man of 1864, notes mm -hmm. from underground. Yeah. 12 years later, in the meek one, sometimes translated a gentle creature, you find that same underground man, and for the first time, you get sustained stream of consciousness like Proust, like Joyce, yeah. like Virginia Woolf, already enacted, enacted in Tolstoy, and he's supposed to be this regular social realist concerned with depicting. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no. No way. But the same bitch with Toni Morrison. She writes the MA thesis on who? William Faulkner and Virginia Woolf. And she would say there is no Toni Morrison and all of her blackness and Americanness and new uh, Western hemisphericness mm -hmm. without her connection to that Southerner, Faulkner and Marquez from Columbia, 
the country of Columbia. Yeah, and yeah. Virginia Woolf, that genius from the British Empire and all of her collection. Well, this is but I can, yeah. uh, can I just ask Cornell something very briefly so that we finish this literary topic. Uh, here maybe we will have so that we don't just agree a small conflict. I agree with all your names, but you didn't mention, and I would support you here. Frankly, I am absolutely for Beckett, but I have problems with Joyce. Joyce works so much in this pretentious, arrogant self-reflexivity. I don't like Finnegan's way. It's too pretentious. It's yeah, too I, 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 endless. I, 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 Beckett is the great guy. Beckett was the real hero under occupation of France. You know, Beckett did not play this game like Sartre, you know. <laughs> this, oh, we just, the okay, this yes. is This here is, he is. perfect. There, here's our brother. Here's our there, brother. This, but remember, yes. now, but Beckett is a minimalist and Joyce is a maximalist, but there's no yes. Beckett without Joyce. That first grade essay on Biko, that first grade essay on literary criticism is under the influence of Joyce, so they go hand in hand. I but know. I prefer Beckett, but I prefer Chekhov even more than Beckett, my brother. <laughs> I don't know where you go on this. Ah, uh, well, listen, you know <laughs> whom I prefer of Russian authors? He developed, an, although he was arrested, an imminent critique of the deadlock of the Bolshevik project, but he was on their side, Platonov. Do you know Andrei Platonov? Oh, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, he's I do. He's the one. He's a, great, he's a great one now. You're right. He's, he's the great one. one, yeah. Well, all right. Since we mentioned Beckett, this is a good transition, actually, because both of you often invoke the famous line from Beckett's late novella, Worst Word Ho, Try again, fail again, fail better. Uh, Slavoj, I, I was with you in Ljubljana last August of uh, 2019. Cele we were, it was the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the, of the university. And the title of the week-long event that you and the, uh, the two others who comprise your Slovenian mm -hmm. troika, our friends uh, Mladen Dolar and Alenka Zupancic, held, the, that was titled Fail Better. And then... Uh, you know, Dr. West, the, the most recent instance I've seen of you invoking this line was, I think it was the interview that you did with Anderson Cooper, um, right uh, after the video of the murder of George Floyd and the, and the Black Lives Matter protests. And more specifically, you know, you invoked that line with regard to, you know, you, as you put it, our witnessing of America as a failed social experiment, um, especially when it comes to the nation's Black citizens, right? And, but you also invoked, I went back and listened, you also invoked Beckett when you spoke with Michael in April and you noted that Beckett's favorite word was perhaps. That's so right. this brings me to my question. So even though uh, Joe Biden defeated Trump and you know, we, we should all be thankful for that. Um, you know, as you've said, Brother West, that you know, it's imperative we defeat the neo-fascist, the catastrophe that is Trump, in order that we can then defeat the neoliberal disaster that mm -hmm. is Joe Biden. Um, even though Biden ultimately, you know, he defeated Trump, it was still obviously a blow to the left, and I would say, you know, to the country, that Bernie Sanders lost the Democratic nomination to a representative of the same old tired, uh, milk toast neoliberalism, the failures of which, as you have both spoken to before, are in large part what brought us Trump to begin with. And, and yet, you know, to invoke back at one could perhaps argue that the left did fail better this time around than we did in 2016. So I guess, I, you know, I want to ask both of you, uh, if you think that's true, that even though uh, we tried again, failed again, that we did fail better, um, why or why not that's the, uh, that's the case? And then a, f a follow up, how might we fail better next time? Or is failing better our only option? So I put it to that question to both of you. Mm -hmm. You want to jump in, Brother Zizek? Uh, please go, go on. Okay. I tell you, all, please go on, Brother Cornell, but <laughs> warning, this is a joke. I will never say to the other guy, uh, uh, Brother Russell. No, he's not my brother. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> He's just a middleman between uh, you know, serving just coffee and so Am I a neighbor? Am I a neighbor? Is that what I, the neighbor? Is that what you I? You are not my neighbor. No, <laughs> <let's go. laughs> 
No, but you know, I, I, would say yes no. I would say yes and no. It's like Paul Salon. You know, you got to speak yes and speak no. The, the, the yes would be that we did for the moment hold off the fascism, but it's like what E.H. Carr said about the Tories. You know, he said the, the rot is still there. It just now proceeds more slowly. So the rot is still in the Biden-Harris administration tied to Wall Street, Pentagon militarism, tied to the white supremacist order and patriarchal order and so forth. Uh, but the no is this though, brother, that one of the reasons why we have not been able to come to terms with Trump is because we haven't been honest in terms of what actually produced him. And we haven't been honest in terms of what actually produced him because Barack Obama still has a halo over him and people don't want to seriously interrogate his role as head, black head of the empire. They don't want to interrogate his role as a facilitator of not just Wall Street reconstruction, but Wall Street greed and the intensification of the inequality, the intensification of the poverty, the Black Lives Matter movement taking place under a black president, black attorney general, and black Homeland Security cabinet secretary. That's when it started, under that official black power with a neoliberal order that cannot deliver protection for poor and working class black folk. I'm not talking about the black bourgeoisie now. I'm talking about the black poor and working folk or president who can assassinate American citizens with no due process. And the New York Times, the Washington Post, none of the pundits, none of the critics, none of the, 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 the liberal uh, 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 writers can say a mumbling word for the most part. You got David Bromwich and Christopher yeah. Hedges and, and, and Brother Paul Street and, you know, the, uh, Glenn Ford and uh, uh, John Mubaraka and others who, who, who are willing, but generally speaking, so that what happens now is there's a sense of which if we go to sleep again, the mm -hmm. second time, it's first time tragedy, second time farce. This is 18th Brumaire Mark, right? But on the yeah, other but time, as Marcuse said, as you know, farce can be sometimes worse than the first tragedy. That's you know? exactly right. That's exactly right. But the other side of this is you got after three and a half years of this American style neo-fascist orientation, almost 60% of white brothers still vote for him. Almost 56% of white sisters, it increases, they still vote for him. Almost 35% of Latinos still vote for him. Almost 30, 32% of Asians, 31% of Jews, 28% of queers vote for Trump. So that you can see the fascist, the neo-fascist sensibility now has soaked in. So even with Trump off the stage in terms of the White House, we've got to deal with a whole culture that is generating these kinds of subjects and agents and try to speak to them. We don't, we don't need to trash them. We don't need to demonize them. We have to engage them and speak to them because many of them actually are suffering, but they don't see an alternative to the neoliberal order other than the neo-fascist one. We've got to convince them the alternative to the neoliberal order is the leftist one. I totally agree with you. And my point, just to go on, would have been uh, of the uh, politicians in the Democratic Party, formally at least, Bernie Sanders, I met some people close to him, knew this clearly. This, uh, how? Because of these links of Democratic Party establishment, Wall Street, and so on, unfortunately, Trump did attract a strong percentage even of the working class votes. That, and not only white, even some Latinos just above in, uh, in southern Texas and so on and so and, on. And black men, 18% 18 of black brothers. Yeah, so uh, I think that, uh, I think that the first problem I see here is that, as you said, Brother uh, Cornell, totally correctly, we shouldn't just focus on the demonization of Trump, as if we lived in a normal welfare state order, and then, I don't know from where, from the moon, this monster came and ruined everything. No, we have to move 
make a step back. This is called thinking and see how was something, what was wrong with our pre-Trump, in quotation marks, normal democracy, so that something like Trump could, could explode. That's absolutely crucial. Another thing, I don't know which advice here to give, but isn't it that it's in very simplified terms that I will talk now, that basically in the United States now there are four big political parties. There is Republican conservative establishment, there are populist Republicans, they overlap, but not quite. Then you have the democratic establishment, more this new digital tech uh, companies and so on. And you have so-called democratic socialists. And for me, the crucial struggle is within democratic party. And I'm not here a total pessimist, as uh, not brother, but whatever, <laughs> Russell, told me once, <laughs> a cynical sense, it's even good that Democrats have now a small ma majority only in Congress. It means if Biden would want to push some legislation, he would depend on A AOC and all that democratic. Within, without them, it would have been difficult for him to get the majority. No, we should be here radically in a good sense, pragmatic, opportunistic. We should, how do you call this in English? soak all the blood out of Biden in the sense of now you have to pay the price. You have to pay the price, no? And again, uh, I agree with you. Trump was horror, but things happen. Imagine socialism is rehabilitated. It's, that's why then Trump had to go to the step of madness. You remember, he claimed uh, 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 Biden is a socialist. Then he was asked, what about Kamala? Oh, Kamala is a communist. And so on. You know, like, yeah, so he was losing, totally losing cognitive, cognitive mapping. But it's a chance for us. And what I, I mean this in a cruel, ironic way, not seriously, of course. But in some sense, Trump did open up in American political edifice, some interesting political cracks, you know. That's why Bernie Sanders often emphasized uh, that we should drop, not we, the Democrats, this obsession with center, you know. We should not lose centrist voice. No, they didn't take the lesson from Trump. Trump moved to the extremes and he won. We, as uh, Bernie said, our target should be those impoverished that you mentioned, Cornell, white and black people who were seduced into voting for Trump. These are our votes, not these upper middle classes whom we should That's right. by keeping calm, That's don't right. worry, we will not tax your wealth, and so on and so on. It's crucial to make this twist. Trump made it for the right side. We should make it for, for the, the left, left side. And you've got 44% of citizens in the U.S. empire who don't vote at all, who are completely outside of the participatory process. They've given up in that wonderful uh, uh, Scylla and Charybdis that you have, though, Brother Zizak, between defeatism and blind activism. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. I think Brother Michael Brooks you know, he would want us to acknowledge the crucial role of what Max Weber called the vocation of the intellectual. Yeah. The vocation of the intellectual is to make sure that people can see things more clearly, the interdependence and the interrelation between empire and class and race and gender, to be able to feel things more deeply so that we have a sensitivity to the suffering of all poor and working people, no matter what color, not just in America, but around the world, and then to act more courageously. We are living in a moment of the colossal failure of the intelligentsia that has so often accommodated itself to neoliberal smartness rather than serious revolutionary courage and joy and vision. Mm -hmm. They have fit in and still want to act as if they're transgressive in some symbolic way. 
the neoliberal university with its disciplinary division of knowledge <laughs> has generated subjects and agents who are so un, uh, are unable to really disclose what needs to be seen more clearly. And this goes from ecological catastrophe to possible nuclear catastrophe to the various social and civic and economic and political catastrophes that our precious human beings all around the world have to live every day. So that the violence they have to come to terms with every day, the calamities and more immoral monstrosities they have to come to terms with every day. So when a pandemic hits the world, so many of our chattering professional classes discombobulate because they never had to come to terms with catastrophe. The masses of people in the world are on intimate terms of catastrophe every day. And we have a, it, it's sad that we don't have enough Michael Brooks's and Zizek's and Chomsky's and Zaid's and, 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 and others to hit this head on. Well, I deeply, uh, I deeply agree with you here, especially with this temporality that you hinted at, namely, I noticed this that for us in the so-called developed West, catastrophe happens as a bad nightmarish moment, 9-11, whatever, That's and right. then everybody talks about it, you come to terms with it, but what about people for whom catastrophe is a daily way of life, it just drags on. The saddest thing I uh, heard was from a black guy who came, he didn't have money even to be there all the time, I of course allowed him to be for three of my classes to Birkbeck College, London, a black guy from, I, he, I think, Burkina Faso and so on, one of those mm. really black countries. And he told me, you know that we even don't have ISIS or whatever. We are so poor and broken <laughs> that we even stopped dreaming politically. Maybe through religion, through revolution, something can be done. They are just in a totally depressive state. Another thing that may interest you, you know how many countries are in the world where uh, the pandemic now is ravaging high numbers, but they, their situation, economic, military, violence, is so bad that COVID doesn't register. For them, this is a minor disturbance. Yemen, Yemen, you know, attacked a civil war, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia intervenes and so on and so on. They are with one of the highest numbers per capita in the world. It doesn't register COVID. We should never forget this. Absolutely. Power. Absolutely. You know where you already see this Western bias of on how we the pandemic. We talk all the time about, at least in Europe, about first wave, second wave, Sorry, but in Latin America already the rhythm was totally different. Absolutely. We had in already you in the United, high point in summer when we had relative peace and so on and so on. I mean, and you know what? What uh, along your lines, Cornel? Where I agree with you. Uh, now there are so many things to fight for. For example, those in power already manipulate COVID to. So that they isolate it and claim, now we fight this, we should forget about other struggles. For example, they claim now we don't have time for ecological struggle, we forget about global warming and so on and so on. Now we have to fight this. And they already announced, not only Trump, also Europe, we will consume more black coal and so on, everything. But I'm worried like hell here. You know that in northern Siberia, on Arctic Sea, Temperature this summer were over 30 degrees. There, Arctic Sea, northern Siberia, usually they were about 50 degrees Celsius. Sorry, I'm talking Celsius. 30 means over 100 in Fahrenheit. So mm. I, I think that Bruno Latour, the French philosopher with whom otherwise I don't agree too much, but he was right at some point when he said that never forget that the pandemic is just a dress rehearsal for a whole series of crises which Absolutely. are coming. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. To see the ecological background which create outside glo uh, global capitalism, there would have been no pandemic. It would have been limited to some 
Chinese city, maybe even there because they wouldn't be eating dead animals or whatever. It's a uh, uh, pandemic is not just a medical phenomenon. It's an uh, economic phenomenon, international and so on and so on. Absolutely. You know, it reminds me in some ways, though, you might remember, but Zizek and Brother Russell, that when, when, when William James wrote one of his last essays, The Moral Equivalent of War, mm. and he was trying to deal with what he thought was be a, was a neurasthenic, a, uh, a nervous, uh, 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 centered, anxiety, <coughs> middle class. They need something to find to substitute it for war. They need some martial spirit. Mm. And he had a good motivation. You know, he's vice president of the Anti-Imperialist League. He was the one that said, God damn America for its vile actions in the Philippines. That was the basis of Jeremiah Wright's famous sermon mm. that, that William James said Obama. this. I didn't know this. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, writes, he writes that out in the pamphlet. You know, he and Mark Twain were the two great intellectuals who joined the anti-imperialist movement. And he says, God damn America for the vile actions in the Philippines. Well, even his essay on, on, a look, on, on blindness in human beings was about the Philippines itself, the inability of American, Americans and American soldiers to see the humanity. But John Dewey responded to William James and said, William James, you're reflecting the silo. We, we love you. You're an adorable human being, mm -hmm. but you're reflecting the silo. For most human beings, they don't need to be reminded of life as a war. They don't need to be reminded mm -hmm. of find some, some alternative to engagement with a martial spirit. They're struggling for food. They're struggling for housing. They're struggling for shelter. They're struggling for education. They're struggling for jobs with a living wage. They're struggling to learn how to love and love their kids and their wives and their husbands and their trans and non-binary, whatever it is. And William James was honest. He said, good God, Dewey, you're right about that. I, I hadn't realized that. Which simply so, Brother Jesus says, 2020. Same thing. Just this catastrophe is just an aberration. It's just a moment, a moment of abnormality. No, it is routinized, institutionalized, and those friends for known called the wretched of the earth every day of their lives. That's why the blues itself ain't nothing but a personal narrative of a catastrophe lyrically expressed. Nobody loves me but my mom and she might be driving too. That's B.B. King. Strange fruit. That is the catastrophe of American terrorism, of lynching, of Jim Crow, of Jane Crow. Good morning, heartache. Here comes that catastrophe every morning. I've got to fight it all the time so that the blues becomes not just a matter of skin pigmentation. It is an existential mode of being in the world for those who have a, both a sensitivity, but also circumstances and conditions under which they know they must have a tenacity, yeah. an, an unbelievable fortitude, not just courage, but no, I, I fortitude. Totally, yeah, totally agree with you, and if I may add, I would just like to introduce a distinction here. You mentioned this wonderful word, perhaps. But I think there are two perhapses. There is an ideological perhaps, that's American ideology. Now you're in deep feet, but perhaps tomorrow you will get lucky, you will become a millionaire. That's, right. that's the false perhaps that's right. which keeps the American machine going. The ideology is that it's not just what it is, it might radically change within the existing coordinates. Then there is the other, Brother Cornelia, I agree totally with you, this more dialectical, perhaps, which yeah. is not just that generally things can be different, but two points that first, to understand what is going on, actually, you also have to include what might have happened but didn't. The whole Stalinism was a horrible thing, but the whole welfare state in the West, let's admit it, was sustained because they were afraid that communism may spread also in the West. No. That's right, that's right, that's right. And so so uh, even this is for me the hope for the left that even if the left loses, it means that it was perceived as one of these perhaps as a day. Mm, mm, I see. But you know, but I but I say I would argue and, and Brother Russell can, can jump in on this. I think that Beckett's perhaps 
yeah. is certainly outside of America because com- Americans perhaps is predicated on the metaphysical and ontological gravitas ascribed to futurity, to ascribed mm. to the future, like the very end of Great Gatsby. Gatsby believed in the green light. Tomorrow things would be better. Yeah, tomorrow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be tomorrow. Now, see that that that's American adolescent mentality. Right. Whitman's that's, Whitman's that's, Whitman's Democratic Vistas. It's there. It's I mean, it's there earlier than that too. But the, you know the. But 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 but, but let yeah. me make this this other point because see now the dialectical thing, my dear brother Zizek brought in this dialectical conceptor perhaps, and I think Beckett's perhaps swerves from even the dialectical perhaps because the dialectical perhaps still has a dynamism in it that's pushing in a certain way. It's almost Bergson like Elan Vital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certain kind of yeah. movement always already. Whereas I think for Beckett, when he says the tears always already are flowing, the domination already is there, even the perhaps itself is more Kierkegaardian without a Christian underlay. And that's a deeper kind of perhaps than the dialectical perhaps that Zizek was talking about, mm. or the American perhaps that is just too Disney. You know like how I man. would formulate this? Uh, uh-huh. I learned this at the university. You know that in some languages, but I think you don't get it in English, only in a immediate way, you get it in French. Hmm. You have uh, the two words for future, future, future and avenir to come. Right, they, right, they right. Are both, they are not the same. Right. So for example, if you say the future president of the United States, it may be the same, but if you say avenir, it's a different gotcha. well, and I think exactly what Future is the compromise. Democracy to come. Yeah. He's, he's using avenir. Yeah, so, uh, so again, I... I see your point, but you know what? I wonder if you would agree this. When people tell me, you are dreaming, no matter what kind of catastrophe uh, capitalism will incorporate it and so on. I say, no, you are not living in the same world as me. As uh, I say, let's stop for a moment dreaming about different future and let's just look what is happening. Capitalism is changing now tremendously. Look, uh, for me, this is a small sign, empirical but important. You remember, Brother Cornell, on the very day when they announced that in United Kingdom and US, uh, uh, that it's in a big depression, 20% uh, or even 30 more unemployment and so on, stock market went up. So we have now a totally independent financial circulation, which right. goes around stock markets are raising, even if poverty is exploding and so on. Then the second thing, I, uh, you know what's my only problem with this formula, uh, uh, neoliberalism? Yes, I agree. But that uh, it renders us blind for something. Today, in more that capitalism develops, more state apparatuses, mechanisms are getting important. Today's capitalism needs a strong state which intervenes all the time. That's Look true. That's true. So, you know, this, I don't, this is what I That's missed true. in the term of neoliberalism, which sometimes promotes this narrative, oh, state is dwindling away already, we just, no. No, but you see, that's precisely <laughs> why, though, brother, when you get a Black Lives Matter movement, you're talking about the repressive apparatus of the state targeting and bombarding folk in a serious way, and same is true with the Pentagon militarism, AFRICOM and on the African continent. The, the 800 military units around the world and expanding under Democrats and Republicans. 25,000 bombs being dropped every year under Obama administration, escalating yeah. under the Trump administration. That's not the state withdrawing and shrinking at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why, that's no, why I think that, that, that's why maybe, thousand. but maybe this is one of the, good side effects of this horrible phenomenon of Trump, you know that it will maybe bring the American public up to a point of sense because I loved a week or two ago, I saw a title on CNN or where, will will Trump succeed in making the coup d'etat, no? 
Usually, till now, this would have been a title for a report from one of the so-called third, third world rogue states. Now we know when we are. United States are a big first world rogue state, you know. This is kind of a sobering moment. We, we can no longer afford that perception. We may have some trouble, but still it's United States, Western Europe, the civilized uh, world. And then, you know, that's why we like TV. TV is a medium of distanciation. You look for bad news on TV. Civil war in Yemen. But then you turn to your wife, children, drink beer. Oh, but here you are safe. No, you are not safe. Well, well this, that's I mean, this true. actually, that's yeah, true. I mean, it, you know, this reminds me of a point, Slavoj, that, that you make a lot, and I'll connect it to, um, to, to Brother Wes as well, that, you know, Slavoj, you often, you point out that even though it's been, um, you know, it's long been fashionable, fashionable, especially on the left, to dismiss Francis Fukuyama's thesis about the end of history, yeah. right, following the fall of the yeah. Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, but, but, none, but the majority, even on the left, or maybe more center left, but still, you know, we nonetheless act as as Fukuyamans, as though things, you know, as though capitalism isn't going through these these changes, and we're not seeing disaster capitalism now. So, like you're right, despite, um, you know, despite disparaging that argument, we're still stuck in. And Biden is a great representation of this. We're still stuck in this pure, uh, this sheer intransigence of imagination or a paucity of of imagination when it comes to thinking the future as the, you know, that line that uh, from Fred Jameson that you often repeat, Slavoj, that yeah, yeah. easier it's for us. Line. I must admit it, yes, Is although it? I repeat it, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's easier, you know, it's, it's easier for us, it's still easier for us to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine not just the end of capitalism, but even a, a relatively modest change in the mode of production so that when Bernie Sanders comes along and uh, Cornell, you talked about this with, with Michael. You know, 50, 60 years ago, um, Bernie Sanders was running on what would have been con considered a pretty modest absolutely. social democratic modest, platform. Modest, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and even, it was nonetheless, even within the Democratic Party, cast as though this was some, like, you know, one-way ticket to Venezuela. Um, and it's, uh, the worry is that and uh, Cornell, you were mentioning this earlier about the, the number of black men, of Latinos, of um, uh, LGBTQ people who voted for Trump because, you know, going back to how it was under Obama, uh, as though, you know, that didn't give us Trump, that's not going to help things. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right. And, you know, exactly Slava, right. Slava, you say at one point, you know, this I'm thinking back of the perhaps, you know, perhaps there is, you know, um, light at the end of the tunnel, or maybe it's another train coming at us. <laughs> You've used that, no, that metaphor. Uh, you, know what, you know what should be our formula? I learned this from some reports in Chile when explosions, sorry if you know this story, when explosions, sorry, when uh, protests exploded more than a year ago, then they came up with a wonderful slogan. We, another end of the world is possible, you know, not against catastrophe. We accept our world the way we knew it is coming to an end. And we shouldn't say, no, no, it will be okay, old normality. No, there will be the end of your world, your ruling class and so on. But those in power, that's my pessimism, secretly know it and they are already preparing us for different catastrophic scenarios. For the ruling class is this living in bubbles, total isolation and so on. For the poor, this terrible choice, either you die directly of hunger or you risk death through. Because you know, all these bubbles and living behind the screen in your apartment, yes, but somebody has to bring, bring you food and so on and so on. So uh, I think that we have to accept that the world as we knew it is coming to an end. That's the hopelessness. But to confront this hopelessness should bring us hope. And things are possible. I'm not talking now even of a radical revolution. Uh, Brother Cornell, would you agree? I knew situation pretty well. I visited them some six, seven years ago. Look at 
at a miracle they did in Bolivia. They respect all the rules of democracy. And they, it wasn't the old leftist story, radical leftists take the over with the best intentions and then in one year, economy goes wrong, you have hunger. No, the standard of living rates, they did very well. And that story is, that's why there had to be a coup d'etat against Morales, Linera, and so on. Not because it was the old story, communist totalitarianism, because they demonstrated how it can work. A socialism which is democratic, which doesn't ruin the economy, they were the most dangerous. No, that's true. That's there true. Is hope. It, that's is true. You know, it, 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 it's very interesting, though, that, um, you know, we had. Uh, uh, brother Fukuyama in our class. With, he, I, he also with, brother with, with, for you. I'm not sure I would include him as a brother. Well, no, no. I mean, as, as a Christian, anybody who's subject uh, yeah, to yeah. culinary yeah. delight of terrestrial worms, having been conscious of language as a brother or sister or not. Yeah. 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 But, but, but the thing is, we, we had him at the, our, our class, our teaching class, Roberto uh, Unger, one of the great uh, social theorists at Harvard Law School. And Fukuyama was there. You know, Fukuyama was a defender of Bernie Sanders this time. Really? Oh, he's going to so much. Oh, huh? yes. And he was reflecting on his pilgrimage, his change. Because you all remember now, it was just not the end of history, but it was also the last man. Yes. <laughs> you had yes. each and last man. You got the T.S. Eliot, hollow man the emptiness, the vacuity that mm. even the neoliberal capitalism generates in culture and in shaping persons, the, the kind of uh, 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 hallowed out character as it were, or the collapse of the ethical substance mm. that Brother Badu talks about uh, um, uh, as well. But for me, what's crucial here, you know, is how do we keep alive in a moment in which we can embrace the a kind of hopelessness as a comma, but not a period. So that yes, it yes, unsettles yes, yes. us in such a way that we then see, feel. I mean, it's like Shelley's poets, right? The unacknowledged legislators of the world, the hierophants of the unapprehended inspiration, the mirrors of the gigantic shadows of the future cast on the present. That's utopian energy at its deepest level. And, and but, but, but this apocalyptic imagination takes me back to my own Christian sensibilities that uh, I was given a paper at the Federalist Society, I uh, given a presentation to the Federalist Society the other day with my, 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 my conservative brother, Robbie George. Sure. They, they let me in the deeply conservative precincts, right? And so I, I, I talked about, well, you know, there's more than one road to serfdom. You all are obsessed with Hayek and the concentration mm -hmm power in the public sphere, concentration of power in the private sphere can push you to serfdom too. The obsession with liberties ends up, you know, liberty for wolves means death for the sheep, but, but death for the lambs. So the, the, the conception of an alternative, the shattering that Tina, there is no alternative. How do you mm -hmm. shatter that over and over and over again within you got Jesus making his way into the temple and running out the money changers. And what's the temple? Wall Street, Pentagon, mm -hmm. Congress, Hollywood, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, World Bank. I mean, all of these oligarchs, plutocrats, sites of ruling classes and predatory capitalist civilizations what is the running out about? Well, it's about a certain kind of calling. It's about a certain kind of witness. And it is a perhaps. Because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a cause. Your world is over. We're going to turn this upside yeah. down, not in any simplistic way. Of course, we're going to have to deal with antecedent practices. But your world is over, morally and spiritually. It is over. It's barbaric. It's greed. It's corruption. It's hatred. It's contempt. All the things that you yourself in your empty rhetoric have, have, have opposed, but in practice, you refuse to stop it. Now, in that sense, it's still very, you know, in some ways tragic comic because, you know, Jesus is headed to the cross. Uh, and that was the reason why they put him on the cross, because he ran out the money changers. Yeah. And the question then becomes, how do we do this collectively in an organized way? How do we do this with a moral and spiritual integrity and yet recognize we're dealing with gangsters and thugs? 
even as human beings, but there's a gangster and thug inside of us, that spiritual fascism <laughs> that Foucault talked about in his introduction to Deleuze's book. He, th that's true. But that ought not in any way disempower us or dampen our fire. That's the crucial can I, thing. Can I, I deeply agree with you. Can I just, uh, 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 Russell, don't be afraid. It will not be too long. I would like to show another dimension of this, perhaps. That's why I think there is even in the ongoing tragedy of the pandemic, COVID, a new, perhaps, states were forced to do things which were unimaginable a year ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> De facto, even conservative politicians, de facto right. introducing some kind of universal income, helping school, putting money into health in a way right. which cannot be justified uh, uh, in the economic terms of the market logic and so on and so on. So they had to do what we Radical leftist preach elements of, of course, now they try to twist and turn it, but some kind of socialized economy. No, it's not the spontaneity of market. We simply, like in a war, you need tanks, bombs. Now we need vaccines, uh, hospitals, and so on. And there is no debate about how will the market sustain it. You have to do it. Another ethical test. That's you right. Know? That's right. It's important that at least, although they will treat like crazy, but that at least the international G20 or whatever accepted the principle that it would have been a global ethical catastrophe if there would have been class and state national distinctions. First, the developed West will get the vaccines and so on. We were here confronted with a dilemma and in principle, there is the right decision. Vaccines for everybody, egalitarian distribution. Absolutely. You, we are, and not only this, then local communities. Friends were telling me, I don't know how it is in the States, but from Spain, uh, Germany, that local communities re emerged because the state wasn't efficient enough. Have, like, no, that, that, that's happening in the States, my brother. And said, wait a minute, let's check our couple of streets. Are there any old people living alone and so on and so on? Absolutely. And, I'm not Very saying that COVID is one step towards communism. I'm not crazy. I'm just saying, <laughs> perhaps, and those in power know it, and that's why their main worry now is with, with the vaccine to get rid of it and then to return to the old normal. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And, and let, me, let, let me just say this, Brother Russell, in response, because I know we're coming to a close here, is that uh, yes. I just want to say, that the very fact that our dear brother Michael Brooks could bring us together in this yes. way after all these years in his own witness, yes. his own vision, his own embracing from Brazil and Lula across toward Turkey and so forth. And, and, and it's just been a, a joy for me, for him to be in my life just like it's a joy for me to be the brother and comrade of Brother Zizak, because I read this brother all the time, even though he writes so much, it's hard to keep track of it. But, and then to get a chance to meet you, Brother Russell, can't wait to read your book on Melville. You've already done wonderful stuff on, on, on materialism and Hegel and so forth. But this is exactly how we fortify each other to keep our intellectual and moral and political armor strong enough so the forces coming at us cannot so easily pierce through and dampen our spirits and thwart our minds, and most importantly, will never convince us to sell out and sell our souls for a mess of pottage. That we'll bear witness to an integrity and a solidarity. All the identity politics in the world ain't gonna mean nothing if it's not rooted in integrity and solidarity that takes the courage to tell the truth in which class and empire become crucial crucial along with the white supremacies and whites and male supremacies and others. But that's the legacy of our dear brother Michael. I totally agree with you. And just to finish, two things you mentioned, uh, 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 Colonel, but uh, I think it should be, they should be emphasized again. First, uh, you mentioned spirit. Yes, we shouldn't become this, the bad version of 
the scarico to run, but the unfortunately is political correctness when you tell a joke, oh my God, are you looking for that? No, we that's right, that's right. To keep the spirit, even the comic spirit alive. Absolutely. No, they will not ruin us. We will still love, we will still enjoy life. They will Absolutely. not make us this, you know, frust frustrated people like, like this bad joke of a, you remember, of a pseudo Christian who you laugh and he says, how can you laugh when our Lord Jesus suffered on a cross? No, Kierkegaard saw this. Jesus is in some deep spiritual sense, a comical figure. You know what Kierkegaard well, takes as an example of Christ? Even saw it better. Gilbert yes. T. Chesterton even saw it better. He hid his mirth. He hid his sense of the comic. He hid his laugh. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so intimate. So just because my publisher will kill me if I don't mention this. <laughs> uh, the, the book of mine just appeared with all books, Pandemic 2, Chronicles of a Time Lost. By time lost, I mean this summer month, no? where I try to go precisely into all this, COVID as a catastrophe and COVID as a perhaps an opportunity, because, as, uh, because I think uh, it is so important that we don't fall into what I call technocratic trap, which is, okay, we can have our leftist or whatever, this. Now it's a serious medical situation. Don't think about politics. It's a, it's a pure medical crisis. No, oh, yeah. we no, need no, no, a no, political no. imaginable moment. The old Absolutely. world dying and all the reaction to COVID are how to fight, uh, how, which new future will be offered to us. Trump offered his rather barbarian future, hundreds of thousands can, can die just that life goes on. Uh, uh, Bill Gates and so on are offering us this technocratic future and so on. Now we have to fight for a different future. Now we are, Brother Colonel, would you agree, this famous expression by Walter Benjamin, dialectic in still stand. Things apparently don't move now, I mean politically. But here the real change is happening. They appear that we are now just in an emergency. No, things are in suspense, but now the new world is secretly beneath the earth. It's, it's forming itself. Now it's the time to be active. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, to, to end this with a reference to what uh, Brother West, you were talking with, uh, with Michael about last time, was that, the sign that this is happening, what you're talking about, Slavoj, is that the democratic, the center, the, the neoliberal corporate center, when they want to coalesce around a project, they can do it. We saw that when they coalesced around, they came together to block, to block Bernie because they know that time is up and that time, I mean, we haven't, we haven't seen a democratic party that united uh, in probably 50, 60 years. That's true. That's so it's, true. it's, it's, it's coming. <laughs> um, well, yeah, but as a perhaps, nonetheless. As a perhaps. <laughs> that's, that's the perhaps. That's exactly well, right. I, I was blessed to be with, you know, Brother Bernie, when we thought we were going yeah. to win out in Nevada. We were already thinking we're on our way to the White House built by African slaves. And at the same time, when they came together, we were not really thoroughly surprised because again, the Obama's uh, uh, neoliberal authority and his phone call that brought all of them together and said, anybody but Trump, anybody but Bernie, anybody but Bernie. What he was saying was anybody who calls into question the Wall Street greed and the Pentagon militarism, anybody who calls into question multiracial solidarity with poor people and working people, Anybody who calls in calls into question our crimes and lies hidden behind our polished neoliberal rhetoric. That's what they were saying. That's the message. In the yeah. yeah, but and you know that's where young folk, especially, but not only young folk, parts of the labor movement, parts of the feminist movement, yeah. parts of the black freedom movement and the Black Lives Matter movement that said, look, we're not gonna withdraw our critiques of US imperial policy in the Middle East and Africa. We're not gonna withdraw our critiques of Wall Street and so on. That's the kind of bubbling that Brother Zizak was talking about, that bubbling up from below as it were. And that is, I think, escalating. That's the good news. 
But uh, <laughs> Brother Cornell, can I just say that this is why your wonderful mistake, no, uh, instead of anybody <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, Bernie, anybody but Trump, it's true because the way centrist Democrats focused on anybody but Trump at any cost we have to prevent Trump from being re-elected. The true strategy was the implied logic message. The main goal is to get rid of Trump, so forget about democratic socialism. We have to right. gather. That's right. Yeah. Everybody right. but Trump was a mask for the true content, which was anybody but Bernie. That's true. Ooh, that's a powerful point. That's a powerful mm -hmm. point. But I'm telling you, you know, this dialogue has been like a jazz jazz trio because we're just bouncing off and riffing off different voices and listening very closely and responding yeah, but, very closely. That's but a brother point. Russell was reduced to just that lazy drummer who every <laughs> one minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Russell. I, I, kept, I, guess, I, kept, I kept the line. time, though. I kept the time, so that's all that matters, you know. Brother Russell yeah. said, no, no, no Elvin Jones here, though. No Max Roach. You just don't just kind of play it real slow. Play it real. No, but that's part of your humility, though, brother. We appreciate that. Because, you know, me, me and Brother Jesus, we could go for hours. If we, had to, cognac, yeah. if we had some cognac together, we just gone for into the night. Because I could talk to this brother just forever, I'm telling you. Listen, the people, the people want to hear want to hear the two of you. So... Uh, I think Michael would have been thrilled by this, and uh, I, I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I had this much fun. So <laughs> thank you both for kicking this off. I think, uh, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning, that there's going to be a number of panels. Uh, Adolf and, and Tori Reid are going to be on the next one on, uh, one of the next ones on neoliberalism with Harvey K. And then we have one on left economics with uh, Mark Blythe, Ben Burgess, and Richard Wolff. So um, those will be coming soon, but, uh, and I think that continuing the project, Michael's vision collaboratively is the best way to, you know, to, to honor him and to carry on his work. So thanks to both of you so much for, for joining us today and we'll all keep, keep um, Jamal. And we, and we want to salute Sister Alicia because she's yes. carrying on in a magnificent way. I'm telling you. Even that's I, great. who often <laughs> agree with you, Cornell, make fun of uh, so called feminist excesses, but I consider myself absolutely a feminist. I don't like it how the lady was erased from the picture so that we, three elder stupid men, could have a <laughs> scene, you know. No, I, today, I, I, today, I, 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 I know as a philosopher, all the best books on Hegel are written. I've read oh, it. Here. Here. Next time I'll Sorry. join you. I just you wanted to sit company. back and absorb it. All the best yes. books on Hegel are written by women. The best politicians who deal relatively well with pandemic. Go through them. Uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, uh, Angela Merkel, not so bad till now in Germany. It's your time. I admit this with my teeth clenched. I'm angry, really. But it's your time. <laughs> you know, better politicians, women are better theorists today, you know. So, we'll do it again. Okay. No, we thank you, though, sister. We thank you. We thank you, yes. Absolutely, Sister Alicia. Wonderful. Love, Brother Brooks. Yes. Love to Love Michael. You all.